you in Health is Wealth show at Women Lines. In our show, we are particular about inviting guests who can share such information which can help you to strengthen your health and achieve balance in your life. So today, we are having somebody from UK who is going to share about importance of immunity in present scenario and it's going to share amazing information which can help you to boost your immunity in life. So let's welcome Dr. Paul Clayton from UK. Dr. Paul, hi, hi, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much for giving your time. You're welcome. I would love to share about Dr. Paul Clayton. Dr. Paul Clayton is a leading scientist in the field of nutrition, clinical pharmacologist, and pharmaconeutritionist who researches the medicinal use of food and how they impact the public health doctrine and advocates everywhere. He is a former chairman of the Forum on Food and Health UK. He has also been a scientific advisor to the UK Government Committee on the Safety of the Medicine. Not only has Dr. Clatton devoted the majority of his life towards public knowledge and education in pharmacology, but he also is actively involved in teaching, developing clinical trials, and publishing books and journals. So Dr. Paul, my first question goes to you, what is immunity and how we can boost it? Can you share insights about it? Oh, well, it's, um, it's a very complex topic and the internet is full of people <laughs> telling you <coughs> how you can boost your immunity. <coughs> but the problem is the immune system has many, many different moving parts, very true. Um, many subsystems, and you have to know what it is that you're trying to, to boost or enhance. Uh, you do things the wrong way and you could end up in trouble. So uh, what I tend to do and a lot of the work that I do, we focus on a part of the immune system that's known as the innate immune system. Okay. This is not the most fashionable area to be in. The, uh, the money, the real money is being made in uh, terms of manipulating the adaptive immune system because that's the part of the immune system which has an immunological memory and that is the part of the system that you can manipulate using vaccination programs. Thank you. Big, big business, and enormous amounts of money, which has led to um, the big pharmaceutical companies um, generating a, a, a large numbers of immunization programs, many of which are potentially dangerous and not worth investing in. Uh, the flu immunization programs, I think, are, are a waste of money, and some of them have uh, been associated with quite a high risk of adverse effects. Other forms of immunization programs, I think, are actually very effective, very successful, such as polio, uh, tetanus, uh, diphtheria. So we have to be granular in our approach. I'm not saying all vaccinations, all immunization programs are bad, far from it, but you have to be critical. There are some where the therapeutic index is extremely high and they're worth doing and there are others where the drug companies are simply making money off the backs of a frightened and vulnerable population. I agree. So that's where the bulk of the research is, that's where the bulk of the money is to be made. But it turns out that the part of the immune system which is more actively involved on a day-to-day -day basis in keeping you healthy is the innate immune system. And I think that we downplayed this for many, many years because Firstly, in evolutionary terms, it's rather more primitive. And you know, we made the mistake of thinking, well, we should go where, you know, the modern sophisticated stuff is all going on. Um, but it, it's the innate immune system, the primitive as it might be, it's still highly complex. And that is the part of the immune system that keeps you healthy from day to day to day. Okay. It works so well, you never even know it's working. And it's very, very rare that an infection breaks through and causes an actual problem that you notice. Now we're surrounded by potential pathogens every second of the day. And it's the innate immune system that keeps you healthy and keeps you safe from these, except maybe once, maybe twice a year, when a virus or a bacteria manages to get through, that's when the adaptive immune system comes in. Now, we ignored the innate immune system, I think, for another reason, because we didn't think we could change it. But now what we're beginning to find is that the modern lifestyle really damages the innate immune system. And what I and my colleagues have focused on is ways of putting back into the diet 
those elements that have been removed, which have damaged the innate immune system, putting back into the food, into the diet, whether it's foods or supplements, okay. these ingredients which bring the innate immune system back up to where it should be. And when it's working as well as it should be, you're almost armor-plated. And it, there aren't any problems. There's no downside. Interesting. Definitely interesting. So how we can boost it? Uh, we know the lifestyle has changed a lot. Diet has changed a lot. We are not getting the original food which we used to get before. So challenge lies in the awareness and people are confused and lost like, okay, what can we do to boost the immunity? Well, I think the best thing to do is to try and eat the diet that our parents or grandparents used to eat. If you can still manage to get hold of those kinds of foods, what you don't want to do is to be eating the ultra-processed industrial fodder that the international food companies produce for us and sell to us at cheap, artificially subsidized prices using technologies such as Bliss Point technology, which makes these foods almost addictive. But these, food, these foods make you sick. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They're full of calories, very low in nutrition, and they cause a series of problems in the body, including a kind of malnutrition because they starve you of nutrients. They cause chronic inflammation because their chemistry is all wrong. They make you overweight and obese because that's they're designed to do that more or less. They drive chronic degenerative disease. So the more of these foods you eat, the more you have type two diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and immune dysfunction. And of course, in this way, the whole population becomes more vulnerable to infection and chronic degenerative disease. And our public health statistics show all this. So my single simplest piece of advice would be stop eating these processed foods, these ultra processed machine made fodder, and learn how to cook. Work with basic food stuff. That's one of the simplest things you can do, and that's going to improve your health in all kinds of ways. But if you're focusing on immunity, then we would then want to discuss um, in a slightly more formal way, what are the ingredients that used to be in the diet that were essential for this innate immunity? What happened to them? Why were they removed? And what can we achieve by putting them back? And it turns out that there's really a handful of nutrients that play a role here. And I can, I'll single out a few of them. The 1316 beta glucans, which um, are best obtained from, uh, from yeast. Okay. Cyanogens, not very well known. But it turns out that the cyanide is actually really important for your health. Now, not too much, obviously. <laughs> you have to get the dose right. Definitely. And, and where do you find these compounds? You find them um, in uh, uh, cyanogenic glycosides in certain cereals, such as millet. You okay. find them in other compounds called glucosinolates, which we derive from brassica. So cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, turnips, mustard, mustard and cress, foods like that. So those compounds have gone, and that really, really damages two key elements in the innate immune system. And then there's a handful of other vitamins and uh, trace elements, which have also been reduced in the diet, which if you put them back into the diet, give you further support. Uh, so I'm not talking about boosting the immune system. I rather think, I, I really think that's misleading. And the whole idea of boosting the immune system is um, suspicious to me. Uh, people who use that phrase, I think, don't really understand what they're, what they're talking about. What we're doing is restoring the immune system to its normal level of functioning. I think, yeah, this makes a difference. It really makes yeah. a difference how we are taking it. So we have to come to original balance uh, immunity ratio, and uh, that will make better sense instead of focusing on boosting it. So mm. I think awareness is lacking in common people and they should be educated. I think doctors can play a lot of role when uh, people are going for their checkups. So they, they should be classes for making them aware that how you can put your nutrients back in your food, which is missing at present. Well, yes, but someone's going to have to teach the doctors about that first because most of them are extremely ignorant about nutrition. They don't study it as part of their medical degrees. I mean, I was at university for um, <coughs> almost 10 years, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> collecting a series of uh, you know, different degrees. And I think in all of those 10 years, I studied nutrition for um, two hours. So I really only began to um, study nutrition and learn what it meant uh, in, um, in, my, in my downtime, you know, after, after, after the... Uh, formal courses had finished, and then after I left university, of course. So most doctors are not the right people to go to if you want advice about nutrition, let alone pharmaco-nutrition. The good news is 
that increasing numbers of doctors today are beginning to get to the point where they realize that the pharmaceutical model, the drug model, okay. we're in an area of diminishing returns. Yeah, we have a lot of different specific, potent, very toxic drugs that we can use to treat the symptoms of disease, but they have been useless at helping people to stay well, at em enhancing public health. And the problem is, while we've been fiddling around, improving people's symptoms, when they come to us with disease in the, back the background, outside the surgery, the numbers of people with these diseases has increased in leaps and bounds, and the diseases are appearing in younger and younger groups of patients because outside the surgery, outside the laboratory, the public is being poisoned, chronically poisoned, by a desperately unhealthy food environment. And unless doctors and until doctors learn that it's not just a question of fiddling under the bonnet, trying to fix things that are broken, it makes more sense to prevent them from breaking in the first place. That is where nutrition comes in. And that, unfortunately, is what doctors are not taught. So increasingly, they come to me, they're coming to my colleagues, and we are teaching them the basics of nutrition, both in classes and in books and distance learning packages. So the situation is bad, but I do see signs of hope. Fantastic. I think baby steps. But yeah, if things start getting uh, this way that all doctors get awareness about the nutrition and they can combine the knowledge of nutrition with the right medicine, we can achieve a lot in fighting diseases and making people uh, disease free. So the combination, uh, combination is the key because I'm not against pharmaceutical medicine. It has its role to play. Definitely. When, when a patient comes to us with pain or disability, we have a duty of care for them. We want to help them. And pharmaceuticals are really good for that. But any doctor with a sense of responsibility, real responsibility for their patients, and it, uh, will want to, at the same time, put into play pharmaconutritional programs, which will undo the deep underlying damage. While the drugs treat the symptoms, we put the pharmaconutritional programs in and actually start to heal the underlying disease process. That's the way to go forward. And that, in practice, is what we're doing now in, I think, uh, 28 different countries, but on an increasingly large scale. That's fantastic. So, Dr. Paul, if we have a look at the data for the last few years, we can make out that public health is declining. Though we have advanced in technology, but intelligence, fertility is falling. People have started getting injected with uh, chronic diseases at a very young age. Autism rates seem to be skyrocketing. What's happening exactly? Why this sudden... Uh, what to say, so many challenges are coming in society and it's across the globe. It's not only one country suffering from all these diseases and challenges. No, you're right. These are global issues and they're very much caused by the increasing uh, amount of ultra processed food that we eat. Now, uh, I better define my terms here because there are different classification schemes. The one that I tend to go with because I, I think it's the most scientific is the NOVA classification scheme. Mm -hmm. And the difference between processed and ultra-processed mm -hmm. foods, the processed foods have been around for a long time. And very simply, when you look at a processed food, you can tell what the original ingredients were. So, for example, a cured meat is processed. Um, canned or frozen fruits and vegetables, they've been processed to some extent, but you can still see what's in them. The ultra-processed foods tend to be those foods where they've been uh, produced to the, you look at the label on the back, the, 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 the box on the back, right. it talks about the ingredients. You're right. talking about large numbers of ingredients, many of which you don't know, which are clearly not foods at Nobody, all. I mean, very few know about it. We, uh, we, we are hardly able to understand it, actually. And it's written so small, it's very difficult mm. to read also. So, <laughs> it's time, <laughs> that's the challenge. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> Here's the key. When you, <clears throat> when, you look, when you look at the food, you can't tell what's in it. Correct. The ingredients are no longer recognizable. And that, that's uh, a pretty surefire way of uh, diagnosing or recognizing an ultra-processed food. And typical foods like this would be the sugar-sweetened um, carbonated beverages, ice creams, breakfast cereals, um, yeah. ready processed and cooked meals of different sorts. I mean, the Pringle, for a Pringle uh, is, is a huge example of this. Heavily processed, you don't know what the hell's in it. They're designed to be addictive. It is. They have a terrible <laughs> nutritional profile. <laughs> but yeah, things are there and kids love it. So family, parents are bringing. But I think mindfulness is required. We have to think twice what we're giving our kids to eat. And now with such awareness that such things are harming our kids, we should be strict in bringing all those stuff at home. Um, well, I don't think it's up to me to tell people how to treat their children. 
but um, I do think that we have a duty of care for them. Very true. And uh, if we're interested in their long-term health and well-being, we should be very careful about what we uh, encourage them to eat. Okay, very nice. So Dr. Paul, there's a lot of awareness related to omega-3, omega-6, and so many medical outlets, uh, uh, outlets are filled with so many varieties of supplements. But mm. people are not having exact knowledge. What is it and what is the importance of the ratio of omega-3 and omega-6? And what they have to be mindful before picking up that supplement. Can you guide us? Well, I think there's a huge disconnect here because on the one hand, there's a lot of evidence, uh, epidemiological evidence that shows that people who eat more fish, at least in some parts of the world, tend to be, uh, have rather healthier, rather better health outcomes. Yeah. And yet when we give people fish oil in prospective and randomized clinical trials, the results are extremely disappointing. We don't see any benefits at all. They don't get improved endpoints uh, in cardiovascular medicine, in um, neurogeriatric medicine. Okay. Fish oil doesn't work. And you then have to ask yourself, why does oily fish promote health, but fish oil doesn't? And the answer is very simple. They're not the same thing at all. There is a lot more in an oily fish than there is in fish oil. Okay. And some very significant mis mistakes were made uh, in the early stages of research into this, when the two Danish physiologists, Bang and Duerberg, who are very famous, said, okay, well, eating this diet is healthy, and it must be the omega-3s, because these fish are full of omega-3s. But they're not only full of omega-3s, they contain something called a fluorotannin as well. And it now turns out that what was healthy wasn't the omega-3, it was the omega-3 fluorotannin combination. It was a binary weapon. Oh. So when these people pulled out just one of those ingredients, they got it half right, but totally wrong. And the fish oil industry, which is worth billions of dollars a year, is a complete confidence trick. It doesn't work. We know this. The fish oil doesn't work oh. until you recombine it with the lipophilic polyphenols, which is what fluorotannin is, which is what well, some companies do now. They're starting to do it more and more. I wrote the first paper about this, I think, about five or six years ago. Okay. And um, I remember going to fish oil conferences back in the day, and the companies who were involved in selling fish oils were literally screaming at me and That's trying to lo lock me out of the conferences because they hated what I was saying. Because I would say, look, you're selling rubbish. You're selling a confidence trick. You're taking people's money and giving them nothing in, in return. And for a couple of years, actually, they made my life very difficult. But now what has happened is that increasingly companies have said, well, I'm, maybe there's something in here. And more and more of them are now recombining the omega-3s with these polyphenols. Um, and I think what we're now seeing, particularly at Zinzino, is that when you do this, everything starts to work. Okay. And we have an, a very big library now, uh, over half a million samples of um, cell membrane lipid profiles. So what we do is we take the blood, we take blood samples, we look at the erythrocyte cell membranes, and we measure the lipid profiles in those membranes. And that's really important. That tells you actually something about what's happening in the cell, as opposed to the plasma lipids that most doctors simply rely on, I think very mistakenly. And what we found is that people who take fish oil, mm -hmm. you can't really tell them from those who aren't taking fish oil, because the omega-3s that they're taking don't get as far as the cell membrane. They get headed off at the past, because the industry is selling them omega-3s with vitamin E. You look at your, if you're taking a fish oil product, have a look at it now, see what the antioxidant is. If it's vitamin E, throw it away. That is not the right chaperone compound. Because if you use vitamin E, it might keep the oil sweet in the bottle or the capsule, but once you swallow it, you're not like a bottle or a capsule. You're a highly reactive environment. And in the body, the vitamin E can flip over to being a pro-oxidant. Now it actually destroys the omega-3s. And what we see when we look at people who've been taking commercial fish oils with vitamin E, there's no omega-3 in their cell membranes. I mean, very, very little. And that's why it doesn't work. So, but, but on the other hand, in contrast, when we look at the uh, cell membranes from someone who's taking this combination of the omega-3s and the right polyphenols, mm -hmm. firstly, the omega-3s do get into the cell membrane. Okay. Because the polyphenol is the chaperone, the chaperone compound that carries the omega-3 right into the cell membrane. But it's more important than that. In this group, we see clinical improvement. 
because not only does the omega-3 get to where it's needed, when the polyphenol has taken it and delivered it to the cell membrane, mm -hmm. it then takes off its chaperone hat and puts on another one, which is, it's another anti-inflammatory agent, which works together with the omega-3s to switch off chronic inflammation. Ooh. Once you do that, then the disease, the health issue that you have, which is being driven by inflammation, stops. And then we see people getting cured. We see their symptoms disappearing. We see their medical dependency fading. Mm -hmm. We see people going back to good health, which is, in the beginning, it was like a miracle, you know, from, but now we've seen so many of them, it's pretty routine. Beautifully explained, and uh, we are really not aware. I have a fish oil bottle, which I'm giving to my kids, and I'm hardly aware exactly what's there. And you are telling us that, yeah, it doesn't work like that. So I don't know what benefit we are getting out of it. <laughs> well, it makes you think you're doing something. And um... this happiness, yeah, we are following the norms. It is written in media that it should be given to kids. We are vegetarians. We don't have yeah. any fish at home. So we thought we should be giving them fish oil. It can help them. But now I'm thinking. <laughs> but if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, for whatever reasons, ethical reasons, um, environmental reasons, religious reasons, um, then there are omega-3 polyphenol combinations which don't come from fish, but come from algae, marine algae. Marine fish, algae. fish don't make omega-3s. They get it from the seaweeds, cold water seaweeds, which are at the bottom of the marine food chain. So in the same way that plants on the terrestrial plants produce omega-6s that get into the food chain, it's the seaweeds that produce the omega-3s and the fluorotannins, those lipid-soluble polyphenols, that produce the omega-3s that get into the krill, the small fish, the large fish, the marine mammals, and finally the apex predator, which is you know, human. All right. Um, so you can cut out the fish. You can cut out the middleman or the middle fish, and you can go straight to the seaweed. And the, um, increasingly, uh, that's what we're doing. So for fish oil also, like people are taking the, I mean, supplements, they buy from market. So can you highlight like uh, what other things we should be mindful while buying the fish oils from the market? Um, well, I think the, the most critical issue is whether they have used the antioxidant vitamin E or astaxanthin. I mean, these are interesting compounds, but they're useless in this respect. Mm -hmm. Or whether they have stuck with nature and used the fat soluble polyphenol. That's what nature uses. In fact, in, in, in nature, you never find the omega-3s on their own or with vitamin E. They're always accompanied by these lipophilic fat-soluble polyphenols. They're always together. They're locked together in the seaweed, in the krill, in the fish. When you look at the body fat of people who eat a lot of these cold water fish, you mm -hmm. find the other the omega-3s and there are the polyphenols as well. Okay. They, always, they always stay together. When the fish oil industry started tearing them apart, because you know the, 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 those polyphenols they color the fish oil and they give it a sort of a distinctive seaweedy taste that the fish oil companies thought people wouldn't like. That's why they purified them. But in that purification, they actually took out, they, they ruined the effectiveness of their product. Uh, but because, you know, they, have makes, they make so much money, they spend so much money on advertising, okay. you know, we, we, we still buy their rubbish and it doesn't do us any good at all. It has a totemic value, a placebo value. But um, that's not enough in my view. Yeah, it's, and it's so sad. Like, we know things are not right and we are not able to do to change those uh, patterns and change those decisions. So I'm hopeful with time, this awareness is going everywhere and people are taking actions and buying the right stuff from the market. I would love to know about the Balance Oil, a supplement from Ginzano, which is to take care of omega intake. And that is quite popular in European countries. Uh, as you are the member of the Medical Advisory Board to Zinzino, can you share your, how Balance Oil is different from other products? Um, really, the only way in which it's different is that uh, we put these fat-soluble polyphenols back into the fish oil. That's all. There's nothing special about it. And since we started doing it, um, one or two other companies have started doing the same thing because they can see that when you use this approach, uh, people actually respond. They get so much better. And I can think, I, I can see that in the future, I suspect almost all fish oils are going to be uh, produced in exactly this way. Zinzino were just one of the, the, the first people to do it, that's all. Okay. They inherited this particular um, balance oil from a company called Oil for Life, 
which was a very small group, Norwegian group, and I had been advising them. So I had been involved with Balance Oil even before it became Balance Oil. And I'd used something like this myself um, 12 years ago, a long time ago now, when I was first diagnosed with uh, Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disease that attacks the thyroid. Uh, I'd been going through an incredibly stressful period in, uh, in my life. And I think it triggered this autoimmune disease. And I was told when I went to hospital for testing, well, what we're going to have to do is to remove the thyroid, and then from now on, you'll be dependent on thyroid replacement therapy. And um, I wasn't crazy about the idea. And what I knew is that in autoimmune disease, it is the immune system that is destroying the target tissue, and it is destroying it through a process of chronic inflammation. And I thought, well, maybe if I could stop the chronic inflammation for long enough, I could persuade my immune system not to attack this target. Maybe it will forget it, go away, and things will go back to normal. It's just a, a wild guess. So I started drinking huge amounts of um, fish oil and uh, olive oil, not a very good source of polyphenols. And I, I really didn't enjoy it, but I, I was drinking very large amounts. And, um, and this was a kind of a crude prototype. And what actually happened was the inflammation stopped. My Graves disease stopped. And I now no longer have the disease. My immune system has forgotten the thyroid. So I'm still working with, you know, the original one, the one that I grew up with, and it works just fine. Fantastic. <laughs> and my yeah. doctors, uh, because every doctor has a doctor, or more than one, I uh, couldn't quite believe this. And they thought, well, you know, you'll, go, you'll get back into trouble sooner or later. But that was that's 10, 12 years ago now. And I'm absolutely normal thyroid function. Then more recently, I started uh, corresponding with a group of doctors in the United States in Boston who've been treating patients with type 1 diabetes in exactly the same way. And it just as, they are, as I found for myself, what they found is that you can reach people early in the disease before the immune system has destroyed the target and there's still residual function there, you can head trouble off of the path. You can tell the immune system, do not attack this target. You're not supposed to be doing this, stop it. And after a while, the immune system will listen to you. It will turn away. And at that point, you no longer have that disease. So this is a very interesting new way of thinking about autoimmune disease. There's, there's other ways, other new models coming through as well. I'm not saying this is the only approach, okay. but it worked for me and I've seen it working for many other people. Fantastic. We'll take a short break and we'll uh, come back again to ask more questions to Dr. Paul. Okay. Welcome back to the show. So yes, Dr. Paul, uh, we'd love to know more about balanced oil and how it plays role in uh, understanding omega-6 mm -hmm. to omega-3 ratio. Can you share for that? Of course, yes. I mean, good health is not just about omega-3. <clears throat> I mean, the omega-6s are important too, and the saturated fats and lots of other things as well. Uh, but I think that what people uh, may not be aware of is the importance of the omega-6-3 ratio. Yes. And that's important because um, in the cell membrane, you need one particular omega-6, which is called arachidonic acid, okay. to start the inflammatory process. And what the omega-3s, EPA, DHA do, is they produce compounds which stop inflammatory process okay. and you actually need to be able to respond with inflammation to certain stimulations such as if you're invaded by a microbe or there's been a physical injury mm -hmm. you need to have some chronic inf some inflammation which is part of your defense so the inflammatory response will help you to kill off that microbe and prevent infection or it's part of the removal of the damaged tissue so that you can then come in and rebuild regenerate and heal that wound. So you need to be able to switch the inflammation sequence on. And then when the good work has been done, you don't want the inflammation to go on because that leads to tissue damage. So you switch off the inflammation with the omega-3 compounds. And you can think of it like the accelerator and brake on a car. You know, switch it on when you need it, stop it when you've had enough. And living in a complicated and, um, <laughs> environment full of problems, full of hazards, is like driving in heavy traffic. You need to be able to create inflammatory responses and then to switch them off again. And then here comes another threat, inflammation and stop it. You need both, you need to have them in the right ratios. But the problem is that, especially if you're eating uh, the, the modern diet uh, full of ultra processed foods, the omega-3s have gone, 
and all you've got is lots and lots and lots of omega-6s. And some of the other really important anti-inflammatory nutrients have gone too, the polyphenols, the 1, 3, and 6 beta glucans, the pre have gone, gone, gone. So now you've got the omega-6s driving the chronic inflammatory response all the time. And the omega-3s, the brakes aren't there, they're not working. So you've got your accelerator flat to the floor, you're going ahead, you're driving this inflammatory sequence. And what that does, it causes the slow progressive destruction of healthy tissue. And if that's in the cartilage, you are moving towards osteoarthritis. If it's in the bone, you're moving towards osteoporosis. If it's in the linings of your arteries, you're moving towards essential hypertension, atheromatous disease, and your first heart attack, which may be your last one. So this is what people are actually talking about when they say that chronic inflammation is the cause of these chronic degenerative non-communicable diseases. So the 63 ratio is important. It's not the only factor, but it is an important, very, very important one. So can we get the testing done? Normally we go to the pathology and we get <clears> the <throat> test done and we understand what's the level of cholesterol and other things which doctor asks us to do, but never heard about omega-6 to omega-3 ratio testing. Is it done? How people can know that there's a difference between from the normal view? Well, the, the standard tests that most doctors will give you are not particularly helpful. Uh, because what they mostly measure are your pla is your plasma lipid profile. And that is changing all the time. It depends on what you had for your last meal, how long ago that was. Um, it's affected by how physically active you've been in the meantime and so the presence of certain other foods that you, uh, that you might have consumed. So these types of uh, parameters, those probes, have very limited value. I mean, I, I wouldn't rely on them at all. Okay. What we look at is the cell membrane profile. And for any doctors who are present, any life scientists, the relationship between the cell membrane profile and the lipid profile is a little bit like the relationship between your HbA1c level and your plasma glucose. Plasma glucose is going up and down all the time, depending on what you've just been doing. HbA1c is a long-term indicator of your ability to manage blood glucose and your long-term health status. It's much more significant. So we've left plasma lipid profiles far behind. We work with cell membrane profiles now. Okay. And there's an increasing number of labs which are specialized enough to be able to supply this. Uh, we tend to work with VITAS, which is at the University of Oslo. It works with the WHO and you know, all those big teams. The important thing is that any company who's offering to uh, sell you a blood test of some sort, it, mm -hmm. just be sure that it is a third party, independent source. and is a validated and well-regarded and internationally recognized lab. Uh, independent is key. I mean, there are some companies who will recommend you, well, go and take the test of this lab, and the company actually owns a part of the lab, so they can skew the results if they want to do that. I'm not saying they, I'm not saying they all do, but I have my suspicions. I think work with a company that if they do offer a test of some sort, that it is a third-party, independent, fully validated system. That's the only way to have confidence. That's the serious information. Uh, we have to be mindful from where we are getting the testing done. And for omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, uh, it, the cell membrane testing has to be done, which we are not sure how many labs are doing in the world. So I think there has to be awareness regarding this. Well, I, I am seeing more labs be beginning to offer this because what we have found is that it is such um, an accurate, <coughs> such a <coughs> useful <coughs> and accurate guide to your well-being, both in the short and the long term. We've, we've left the plasma measurements far behind, as I said, and we, we wouldn't want to go back to those. Interesting. So Dr. Paul, you have come up with a new book, Strengthening Your Immune System. So can you highlight what readers can get out of it? Have you actually got a copy of that book? Because I haven't even seen it yet. It's, this is so new. Or, uh, I've just uh, seen the photographs and uh, I have seen uh, the mention so I'm really interested to know that this is something should be valuable and should be read by everybody because something interesting is there. Can we just highlight about it? <laughs> yes, of course. <coughs> well, um, it's really <laughs> to do it yourself guide to improving your immune system. And I talked before about 1316 beta glucans and cyanogens. And, you know, I show how important those are, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, for example, you, uh, there are certain spices, uh, for example, which contain compounds 
which stop bacteria from talking to each other. And that might seem a little bit esoteric, but when a, a bacterium penetrates your first level of defense and gets into the deep tissue, they do something called quorum sensing. They talk to each other. They don't want to call attention to themselves when there's only a very few of them because you know they're up against the immune system and they are trying to keep quiet. So what they do is they gradually increase their numbers and they talk to each other. And when the levels of communication get above a certain threshold, they realize, hey, there's enough of us now. We can take this and we can overcome the immune response. And then they start becoming virulent. Then they start producing toxins. Then they start producing, they may ca causing huge problems. What we found is that there are certain spices, for example, which interfere with that communication. And it fools the bacteria into thinking that there aren't very many of them and they're not ready to start any problems. So they just hunker down and don't cause any problems. So that's a completely new approach to, to infection. Uh, and that's a part of the book we talk about that. And another part of the book talks about um, the microbiome. Because the microbiome are these countless numbers of, of bacteria, microbes, viruses, phages that live mostly inside the, inside the large intestine, but in many other areas as well. That's also part of our defense. But the defense doesn't work very well if you eat the modern ultra-processed diet because that's missing in certain key ingredients that always used to be there that supported the growth of healthy microbes. And those healthy microbes were then part of our defense, our immune system. And so what I talk in the book is I talk about how you can make simple dietary changes which will increase the numbers of healthy bacteria, improve the microbiome, Mm -hmm. and improve your immunity as well. And there's all kinds of other uh, very simple things you can do to enhance the activity and functionality of different parts of your immune system. Um, I know it's very fashionable at the moment. We could talk about COVID-19. Uh, and some people are saying, well, we should all shelter in place and uh, pull the bedclothes over our heads and never get up until the disease is over, which is ridiculous because it's really just, it's just kind of like a bad flu, that's all. Yeah. Um, but there are other strategies, I think, rather than wait for vaccinations, and they're probably never going to appear because we've never developed a successful vaccine against this family of viruses. I don't know if we can. Could there be a nutritional tool which would help to improve your resistance to infection? Well, firstly, if you're not eating out processed foods, you're less likely to be overweight, to be hypertensive, to have diabetes. In other words, already your risk profile is going down. And if you do get the virus, you're going, probably not going to have too many serious problems with it. You'll deal with it as I have done. But is there more that we can do? Well, um, I think there is. I produced a formulation which is called Extend. And it wasn't anything to do with COVID. It was actually designed, it was an imaginative formulation that was designed to protect us against disease X, which is why it's called Extend. Now, disease X doesn't actually exist. <laughs> it, was, it was a theoretical disease that the WHO dreamt up several years ago, and they were thinking, well, we're seeing more and more emergent viruses entering the human population. And that's true. We, have, we are seeing this. And these are the zoonotic viruses. They're jumping into the host, human host population from their original host, which is usually... Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, a pocket, it's a pocket of bats that live in a cave in, in Guam or, or a, a colony of stick insects that uh, live in the Congo. And we're coming into contact with more and more of these species because of increased urbanization, population pressures and spreads. And then because we have uncontrolled mass travel, you can pick up one of these interesting new viruses in one country or one continent and bring it to the new continent even before you have any symptoms. So screening is um, pretty much impossible. And I thought, well, this disease X, what is it? Well, the WHO speculated that at some point, one of these viruses would emerge into the human population and would combine high transmission rates with high virulence. So it spread quickly and kill everybody. The Andromeda strain. And this was the nightmare scenario. Yeah. But and I thought, well, um, I mean, COVID isn't that. It's nothing like that. But I thought, well, okay, if disease X ever happens, what could we do to protect ourselves to improve herd immunity? So I went all the way back to basics and started looking at what are immune defenses against viruses? How do they work? Mm -hmm. There's many of them. But although this is a little bit oversimplified, our innate immune defenses against bacteria are mostly cellular. They involve immune cells such as macrophages and neutrophils, cells like that. And our immune defenses against viruses 
are mostly chemical. Not all, but mostly. And again, if you've got any wonks in the audience, they'll say, well, what about natural killer cells? What about B cells and, yeah. uh, and, and, and T cells? And of course, yes, they do play a role, but they're not the first line of defense and they're actually not very good either. The first line of defense, the body is able to make a series of chemicals, which are, they don't kill the virus because you know, it's a moot point as to whether the virus is alive to begin with. It's more like a crystal. But what they do is they damage the virus to the point where it can then no longer invade the next cell, multiply, kill the cell, and then continue that cycle. So. Now the body makes four compounds in particular, hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid, hypothiocyanide, which technically is a pseudo halide, and hypoiodide. And all of these are sort of they're like mild oxidizing agents or mild bleaches. That's oddly enough what Donald Trump was talking about when he was thinking we should drink bleach. He wasn't talking about domestic bleach, but then of course this whole propaganda war sort of tried to spin it off. Yeah. Um, but what these compounds do is they damage uh, sulfhydryl groups, which you find on the coats of many viruses. And the virus can then, it's there, but it can't do anything. It can't invade the next cell. It can't cause a problem. And then I thought, uh, well, how is it that the body is able to do these things? How does it make these chemicals? And when you look at the machinery that the body requires to make these four compounds, it's very dependent on the availability in the diet of a group of micronutrients. And then we looked at changes in the diet over the last 70 years or so. And guess what? Levels of all of these compounds have declined, which I think leaves people individually and at the public health level, the herd level, really damaged. Their innate immune systems against viruses in general has been degraded. Mm. So what I did in this formulation, I decided well, let's put everything back in that we know that the human needs to make these four antiviral compounds. And um, then when COVID came along, I thought, well, I don't think this is that dangerous of a virus anyway. And if I believe in this, I should put my money where my mouth is. And I didn't have time to apply to an ethics committee and set up a clinical trial. And I don't think anyone would have agreed to it anyway. But um, what I did was I, I, I started using this. And then I went to a whole bunch of very crowded place, uh, places where there were lots of people milling around. I didn't use a mask, didn't wash my hands. I actually did a lot of hand to mouth stuff. And I picked up the virus, it didn't take long. And it's not a big deal because I think you know, the odds are quite high I would have got it anyway. So this wasn't really anything heroic. I didn't think I was putting myself at substantial risk. And so I got the virus uh, and you know, I mean, for about a week, I didn't feel very well. I had the fever, you know, the loss of taste, you know, aches and pains, but you know, I've had worse hangovers. I mean, although, I, I, let me just say, I'd have to go back 50 years to when I was at medical school. <laughs> I don't do that sort of thing anymore. But it wasn't really a bad deal. Now, I am theoretically <laughs> in, a risk, in a risk group because I'm, now, I'm, I'm in my seventh decade of life now. And <clears throat> I should not have done particularly well. I mean, the odds are in that age group, you are going to have more of a problem. But I have to say that for me, the experience of COVID and 19 was um, was pretty easy going. I have a slight residual cough, but otherwise I'm about 95% and recovering fast. Now that's really uh, not scientific. It's a single, simple case history. You can't extrapolate from that. It is the lowest level of scientific evidence. But um, I would say that the pharmacology, my own personal experience, and quite significant numbers of other people I know who've been using Extend makes me think, well, I think there's something here. Okay. And um, I think that um, as this is a very safe approach, it has no downside. <coughs> if we could improve public nutritional profiles to the point where at least we knew they had normal antiviral protection, we can improve the herd immunity in that way. And it would be some level of protection with no downside. Unlike you know, the, the problems that we know exist with the, uh, the current medically approved treatments. Um, the latest of which, of course, is uh, remdesivir, which really has almost no evidence of effectiveness at all. And yet it's being promoted uh, by Fauci and the rest of those shills for big pharma, who I think have no interest in public health whatsoever, but are very interested in making enormous sums of money and who go along with this nightmarish Bill Gates scenario where everybody is microchipped, everybody is tested, everybody is tracked all the time, and we are reduced to being microsurfs. 
No, I think that's a terrible future scenario. What I'm interested in doing is showing people how they can take some simple, safe steps to improve their own immunity, their own health, and be less dependent on a medical establishment, which I think is increasingly out of control and dysfunctional. Makes so much sense. I think that knowledge has to be spread out across the globe so that people are taking their health in their hand and they are eating the, the food which is having all nutrients. It's all about creating that awareness, I suppose. And taking responsibility for your own health rather than living a terrible lifestyle, lifestyle. And then when something inevitably goes wrong, go running off to some medical expert who is never going to be able to do anything other than patch you up. And it's, you know, never. It's, I, I, I regard 21st century orthodox medicine as extraordinarily primitive. I mean, we look back at 19th century or 18th century medicine as being barbaric. We have made very little progress, in my view. We have uh, prioritized Pasteurian medicine, magic bullets, at the expense of a, a form of medicine which you can trace back not to Louis Pasteur, who was a great medical scientist, by the way, but to his contemporary and compatriot, Louis Bernard, who we know as the father of physiology, but who actually did a lot of other work. Where he talked about the importance of uh, le milieu intérieur, um, um, by which he was talking about the, the metabolism, the, the environment inside the host. Mm -hmm. And he was more interested in strengthening that to the point where the host, the individual, could then protect himself or herself. So the form of medicine that we practice dates back, is, is influenced Pasteur, by Pasteur, but really originates with Claude Bernard. They're two complementary disciplines, and we try to practice them both. Fantastic. So do look out for the book when it is there, friends. It will give you immense knowledge how to take care of your health and take your health in your hand. So Dr. Paul, my last question is, can you share a message with women line readers and followers? What is the best way they can take care of their health and immune system? Some tips for them. Mm. Look, I mean, everyone else, <laughs> everyone says, don't smoke take some exercise, eat fruits and vegetables. I mean, and I, of course I go along with that. I mean, I'd be foolish if you not to. And that'll take you so far. But I think you can go further. The evidence is that you can go very much further than that. And so I would say there are certain groups of nutrients which you can obtain from very certain types of foods. And if you incorporate those into your diet uh, continuously and strategically, you will then enjoy vastly improved health prospects, both in terms of infectious and non-infectious diseases. I think what our science is about is improving health expectancy. And if you improve health expectancy, improved life expectancy comes along as a side effect. That's not our primary end. I'm, I'm not interested in living forever, but I am interested in living as healthily as I can for as long as possible and sharing that. So these are very simple do-it-yourself routines that, uh, that are very easy to pick up. And I'm currently working with a very talented chef and a food historian on how to build these ideas into recipes and into dishes that you can then integrate more easily in, into, uh, in, into your eating habits. So that's, that's, that's my next project. Awesome to know that, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much for sharing such wonderful information. Let's get our friends to take our health in our hands and lead a healthy life. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Take care. Goodbye. You're very welcome. I'm sorry for the coughing. Bye-bye. Take care.